this is based on the report that we published or, or was released last year on incidents and, uh, of induced abortions and the magnitude of complications from unsafe abortions in Kenya. About 22 million of those abortions are actually uh, unsafe. And out of these, about 98%, almost all of them, are occurring in uh, developing countries where a lot of our sub-Saharan Afri African countries are. It is also evident that about, and it's been estimated that about 8.5 million women suffer globally uh, from serious complications from these, some of these unsafe abortion procedures. And again, it's also estimated that about 13% of all the maternal deaths could be attributed to unsafe abortions. If we, li we listen to the statistics, 40 million abortions globally, 22 million of which are induced, many times unsafe. That is a clear indication that the choices cannot be limited to one aspect. A friend of mine famously quote, wherever there are women and men, there'll be sex. And wherever there are sex, there'll be wanted and unwanted pregnancies. And whenever there's, there's unwanted pregnancy, there'll be abortion, safe and unsafe. And whenever there are unsafe abortions, there will be complications, almost certainly. So whatever decisions we make, as healthcare providers, as professionals, as policy makers, we must bear that in mind. Studies before have looked at the cost of inpatient care, the cost of complications, and of course the cost of death. So I would say there are major cost implications running into millions of Kenya shillings as a result of unsafe uh, abortion. Unsafe abortions, rather, abortions have been going on in this country from time immemorial. From time immemorial. The statistic which you're seeing there is for women who have had complications. Those who take the strong tea leaves and the jigs and the abortion somehow is successful, don't become a statistic. Don't go to the hospitals. Mike Mutua will not see them because they will not come to the hospital. It will be a complete abortion. Unsafe though, but complete. I got my pregnancy when I was in class eight. I had nobody to, to talk with. I had nobody to cancel me. So I, I used to be pressured by my, my friend to, to abort. When I go to my mom, she, she chased me away from our home. So I had no option. My option was I just joined the, the gang group and started using drugs. Some of the girls dropped, they got married, and some of the girls died because of abortion. Uh, if a woman comes to me and tells me that he, he uh, she wants to abort, there is a hotline, antigen hotline. Uh, there is a hotline, I normally give out the number. That hotline number, it talk all about reproductive health. So there, there are some, some things she is going to be told there, and then she can make a choice. And if a woman, if the pregnancy is less than three months, we can talk to a woman and use the Mr. Prostol thing, like Dr. Uh, Dr. Caro said. Article 26.4, which says that abortion is not permitted, I except in the opinion of a healthcare provider or trained health professional. For us doctors, to make an opinion, you have to have the history of the person. Are they pregnant or not pregnant? You've got to examine them and make sure that they are pregnant or not pregnant. And you have to do investigations. That's the opinion. What does that mean? It means that in Kenya, according to that article, actually, abortion on, abortion, on demand or by requ on request is not permitted in Kenya. And the same constitution says, in Article 2.5, the general rules of international law shall form part of the law of Kenya. This is the constitution talking. It's not anybody else. Article 2.6 says any treaty or convention ratified by Kenya shall still form part of Kenyan law. And then also we look at key international human rights instruments, which we didn't sign on our own behalves. It was signed by our leaders, ratified. And the bodies which interpret them recognize the importance of ensuring access access to safe and legal abortion. And if you're looking at reproductive health, 
which is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. We don't go door to door. Excuse me, is there someone who wants an abortion here? No, we don't go door to door. Women come to us. They are mentally disturbed. They're physically disturbed. Their social construct is affected. We don't go door to door looking for abortions. We're helping women who access us. We have not ratified any legal instrument that expressly allows abortion. In fact, the only document that allows abortion, I'm just talking about the law, is our constitution. I think as Kenyans, we have to realize that the constitution stands for life. If people go to the churches, let them discuss these things fully and openly. After all, their churches up to the smallest village. If they go to the mosques, let them do so. Can we discuss these things, even in schools? Can we discuss these things in any, even a public baraza where the chief is? Throw in something because, as you said, this constitution, even for the educated people, it is so complicated. <laughs> there are very few people who understand it. Only if you have interacted with it in terms of advocacy and things like that. The constitution is there, but it places the burden, the, the burden of providing comprehensive abortion care services in the hands of providers. The government, therefore, has a duty to come up with policies to train our healthcare providers. What we are trying to do is that to ensure that the access, when a woman decides to terminate a pregnancy, the first point of um, resort should not be a quack. It should be a healthcare pro provider. Therefore, when we talk about criminalizing access to safe abortion care, then we reduce those choices. What we need to understand is that the, what we have in Kenya as a law is not ideal. It's what we have. So we do the best with what we have to ensure that women do access services. We know that criminalizing abortion or liberalizing it, what it determines is the rate of unsafe abortion. So what we have as 465,000 unsafe procedures as in the year of 2012 is proof that our laws are not saving the lives of our women. So that's what we are talking about here today. How do we facilitate healthcare providers to save our women? Because in every option we've had to, to talk about here, we haven't actually sh sh shown a light to the right of a woman. And I will finish with um, a specific quote from a compendium from the African Union uh, Social Affairs Committee that says this, all existing African nation, national abortion laws, in fact, provide for legal abortion in some or all of the circumstances in the protocol. This is a Maputo protocol. If you look at the whole subject and the discourse of uh, abortion, the whole thing about getting pregnancy, whether it is wanted or not, it uh, has a lot of social connotations behind it. There are cultural factors. If you look at organizations and even churches, the issue of sexuality, the discourse about discussing sexuality is a silent, silent uh, 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 topic. And what are we saying? How many people within the community or within schools actually actively educate, empower the girl child and the boys for that matter to be able to understand what it entails to have sex and the outcomes they are in. We talk about law. Tell me how many times you think law when you are walking around. How many times do you think about a certain issue in, in, in the Constitution? Human beings are not meant like that. We think about the things that are affecting our lives in the immediate period. And the decisions you take for heaven's sake, there may be a no relationship with legality. You just have to think about that later. And that is what happens. A 15-year-old girl will not sit, sit down and start thinking, what do I do after this? But she has a pregnancy. She, know the, she knows that the, the father or the community is against it, so that social pressure. The parents have not been taught to accommodate the girl. The church is telling her now you cannot even take your ratios. In the, in, in the church, so she is forced to take this drastic action. We need to look at all the dimensions of life so that we can be able to meet this girl at the point of need. And you can do as many abortions as you want. If you don't cut the source, 
you are really wasting time. If you want to treat malaria, I mean to, to, to eradicate malaria, you start by using nets. You start by clearing the bushes. You don't wait for people to get malaria and give them anti-malaria. It will not go anywhere. If you Google, or if you go to the internet, or if you read any documents about successes in combating public health challenges globally, none of them, all of them took a comprehensive approach. None of them took a vertical, minimalistic approach. Take HIV, take countries that have eradicated malaria, take the success of eradicating polio. So all public health issues can only be dealt with from a comprehensive approach. So if you look at the issue of um, reducing death from unsafe abortion, which is a public health issue, you have to take it from a comprehensive approach. We have to provide sexuality education. We have to provide legal education. We have to provide all sorts of education which aims at the preventative aspect of reduction. We have to reduce unintended pregnancies because we know majority or a lot of them can be as a result of this. So we have to talk about family planning and all of, and the people in front of this, some of them are talking, talking about that. But we also have to now, uh, another step, we have to look at how do we actually reduce the unsafe abortion itself. This could be dealing with those providing illegal abortion, but at the same time, when, when a woman has to have an abortion, to reduce that unsafety, then there have to be something about safe abortion. You cannot hide and you cannot run away from that. You have to address it. When Kenya uh, ratified the Maputo Protocol, it reserved Section 14, which touches on abortion. Somebody made a comment about the complexity of sexuality and that you cannot compare sexuality with traffic. Of course you can't. You can't compare one crime with another at one level. You can't even compare one abortion with another. Each is unique. But there is a level where you can make comparison. Each is a crime. And don't forget I also refer to other sexual crimes like defilement, like rape, which continue even despite all the efforts to fight them. So that is why I'm saying the perspective of the criminologist recognizes the uniqueness of every crime, but also common factors in each crime and common ways you can use to address a crime. 99% of abortions, so there's a study in America, but they considered other situations in other countries, are abortion on demand and not for life or health of the mother reason. That is the same thing in Kenya. It is abortion on demand. Why? It is because I want to, I feel uncomfortable with this thing. It's not because I really suffer a grave risk of health to my life. In that study, they referred to a director of an IPPF clinic in the US. This is a lady who was responsible for overseeing thousands of abortions in her clinic. And she was being asked, do women do abortions for grave reasons or light reasons? She said, there are those who do for grave reasons, there are those who do for light reasons. If abortion is legal, if it is legal, you can do it for any reason. She said, some of the women we have aborted here were having the abortion so that they could go to the beach and wear swimwear and look nice. This is what she said. So the reality is, when the law allows something, you cannot start putting a limit as to the reason you will do it. It's legal. You can do it because you woke up in a bad mood, or it can be a very serious reason. Whatever the reason for the abortion, the abortion has substantial uh, effects on the woman. Women do not terminate pregnancy for obvious, obvious reasons. <laughs> not for flu, not for discomfort. It is a painful decision to make. And I would like to quote some, uh, some writer. In 1981, Richard McCormick wrote in a book, How Brave a New World, and this is what he has to say. Abortion is a matter that is morally problematic, pastorally delicate, legislatively thorny, constitutionally insecure, economically divisive, medically normless, humanly anguishing, and it is anguishing, racially provocative, journalistically abused, personally biased, and here I would like to add the element of moral judgment and dual moralism, where if it is my daughter, it's a very easy decision, but if I'm standing addressing people in Safari, uh, in safari Hotel, I make a very different decision. But finally, it is widely performed. And jailing 
uh, healthcare providers doesn't stop abortion. It only makes it go under the floor so that instead of abortions, you have, I mean, instead of uh, safe abortions, you have deaths. 